Good morning. I'm Pastor Lily Descalis. I'm one of the co-lead pastors here at Madisonville First United Methodist Church. And, um, you know, what a joy it is. You know, it's, remar- you know, it's remarkable today, uh, just in worship. Some, there are things that connect us together, and the ability to have this Easter mission offering that in a church, a United Methodist Church in Poland, that I'm sure many of us have never even been to Poland, but somehow we feel connected to them because of their name and because, you know, at least a couple of people here have met them. So we feel connected, and I'm amazed by the connections. And I just wanted to name that, how I feel connected to each and every one of you, too, and what God is doing and, and how we are being called to be the church here in this place and around the world. It just amazes me sometimes. It amazes me. We're going to be continuing a sermon series today on holy interruptions. Don't worry, you're not going to get rudely interrupted today. (laughs) I won't make you jump out of your seats today. But uh, we're going to be looking at a scripture passage from the Gospel of Mark. It's a familiar passage to many of us. Um, And it's where Jesus heals a paralytic. And so let us hear now the word of God for us today. When he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. So many gathered around that there was no longer room for them, not even in front of the door, and he was speaking the word to them. Then some people came, bringing to him a paralyzed man, carried by four of them. And when they could not bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him, and after having dug through it, They let down the mat on which the paralytic lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, Why does this fellow speak in this way? It is blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but God alone? At once Jesus perceived in his spirit that they were discussing these questions among themselves, and he said to them, Why do you raise such questions in your hearts? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, stand up and take your mat and walk? But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he he said to the paralytic, I say to you, stand up, take your mat, and go to your home. And he stood up. And immediately took them at and went out before all of them so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Dear Jesus, sometimes we need you so much that it's worth breaking down walls and barriers to get there, to get to you. And so, Lord, I just, I pray today for those in this place or those listening online that have some barriers that need to be broken through today, even if it's a little messy. Lord, Interrupt us today. Show up in our lives. Help us to hear you. Help us to see you. Redirect our attention to what your will is. and Help us to follow it. And may your word show us how we can and how we should. May the words of my mouth And the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing to you, O Lord, our God, our rock, and our redeemer. Amen. Some people had a friend who was paralyzed, and they wanted to get their friend to Jesus. Because they thought that Jesus would be able to heal him. But they couldn't get to Jesus. They couldn't get to him. And so they decided to go about with a more creative solution. 
Now, we may not think of, you know, digging a hole in the roof of a house as something that we would do as a creative solution. There's something that would be easy at all, but houses in those days were commonly constructed by having this flat roof that was often used as an additional open living space. Think of something like a rooftop deck, all right? Something like that, and there would have been steps on the outside of the home in order to access this space. This was a very common way that homes were built. And so they would have gotten up there and they would have been digging through the roof and we again think, well, that's a lot of stuff to dig through. That's had to have taken forever. But actually, again, the construction of that day, these houses, these roofs, they would have been made of a mixture of brushwood and clay. And so it was enough to keep the elements out. It was enough to be able to, it was sturdy enough to walk on or even sit things on. But if you chipped away at it a little bit, you can get good chunks of it. And so eventually it was easy to dig out. Roofs were easy to dig out. But it still would have taken some time and it would have made a mess on the inside of the home and Jesus would have been teaching and you can imagine me up here preaching all of a sudden little bits and pieces of the ceiling we would think something was majorly wrong if that happened here wouldn't we but these little little bits and pieces and sometimes there would be some bigger pieces and they're falling all around him and they say the house was so crowded you imagine it's falling on people's heads even they're like what's going on what is this dirt coming from and so I'm sure people were distracted and probably a little annoyed by it. After all, these people digging a hole in the roof, they're interrupting the teaching of someone that they really wanted to hear. And it wasn't just someone shouting at Jesus at the side of the road or sneaking up behind him in a crowd to touch his cloak. This was a messy, in-your-face kind of interruption. It was impossible to avoid it. It made a big mess of things. And I know me personally, I don't like messes. I don't. At home, I will ask my children to clean up a mess in the house, and I normally get one of two answers. The first is, what mess? What mess? Yes. Well, you know, those toys that you're tripping over or this bag of food that for some reason is just spreading crumbs all over? That mess drives me up the wall. It does. But the second response that I can get from them is just as bad. That's not my mess. <laughs> or the similar, I didn't do that, so why do I have to clean it up? Anyone ever hear those words? Anyone? I feel like a lot of my life is spent dealing with and cleaning up messes. You can look at my pew on your way out just to get an idea of that. And even if it's not children in your house, perhaps it's a spouse or other family member or friends or coworkers or maybe even a pet, but it feels like there's always something or someone to clean up after. It never ends. And it's not just the everyday messes of life that get in the way. Our lives are filled with interruptions, and oftentimes, just like the mess of a roof being dug out, those interruptions, they make a mess of things. They make a mess of our plans and our dreams. They can cause minor and major detours on our perceived trajectory of our lives. Messes can be made of our relationships, our bodies, our societies, and our ways of thinking and these normal modes of operation. Messy interruptions can be very personal to us, and at the same time, they can affect entire communities. Messy interruptions in some cases can be caused by our own personal action or inaction, but more often than not, situations and circumstances outside of our control are the things that cause us the most frustration and pain. We didn't make this mess and yet we're the ones left standing to deal with it. 
we didn't ask for this, but it's ours anyways. And I bet Jesus felt like that too. His entire ministry was about getting interrupted by and cleaning up messes he didn't make. And our scripture reading from today is this perfect example that provides even some beautiful parallels to some of the messy interruptions that we experience in our lives. Because sometimes the messes that interrupt him, they're these literal messes, like a roof falling in and getting dirt everywhere in a home. They're literal messes we have to deal with. Sometimes there are these medical messes, like the broken bodies of friends and family that we feel compelled to care for, and we'll do anything, including breaking down walls or roofs in order to get them the help they need. Other times it's spiritual messes, like the religious scribes being so caught up in thinking that Jesus was making a mess of sound teaching by taking on the authority of God and forgiving someone's sins, that they couldn't see God in human flesh standing right there in front of them. What is to be done when these messes are made? What are we supposed to do when these messes happen and they throw us off balance? What does Jesus have to say about how to deal with them? And that's where we can look to this scripture, as well as other scriptures too, but this one for today, to see how Jesus responds to these messy interruptions that he encounters, so that we can seek to follow his example when we find ourselves dealing with with the chaotic surprises and unplanned situations that we face. And the first thing that Jesus models for us in this scripture is that he acknowledges that there's even a mess. Jesus didn't pretend it wasn't there. He acknowledges it and he seeks to do something about it. And it may be silly to name this, it might, but let's be honest. When something disrupts you and throws you off course, how often do you think or think or even think about trying to shove it to the side, out of sight, out of mind type mindset? What a mess, what mess, what mess? I don't see a mess. Everything is fine, it's fine. I'm just gonna set this to the side and maybe if I ignore it, it'll just disappear on its own. Sometimes we don't want to deal with messy interruptions in our lives, and so we go to great lengths to pretend that they're not there or to even try and hide them from others. And we also sometimes just kind of give in to it. This is an acceptable way to live, right? It's not perfect, but I can deal with it for now. Who cares if the roof of my life is falling in? I'm just going to set out a few buckets, and it's going to be fine. It's going to be fine. Y'all know you do it. We all do. But Jesus, he didn't shirk away from this interruption or ignore it. He confronted it and he dealt with it. In doing this, he models for us that we should pay attention to what interrupts our lives and not try to hide or avoid it. Unlike my children and other people that I know who can't see a mess in front of them if it would have bit them, we shouldn't try to run away from or pretend that these messes aren't there. We should consider every interruption, no matter how messy it may be, as an opportunity for God's power to be made known, for healing to occur, for lives to be changed. Because every interruption has the potential to be a holy interruption if we let God make it holy. And spoiler alert, God always will. And secondly, Jesus models in his response to those who, are interrupt, who have interrupted him how faith, faith helps us to deal with interruptions. 
There are so many striking things that happen in these 12 verses, but one of them was the motivating reason for why Jesus chose to respond to the paralytic man. It wasn't the actual mess the paralytic friends made. That's not actually what Jesus said made him pay attention. It wasn't even the paralytic man himself, but it was the faith of his friends that Jesus noticed, that scripture tells us. Faith that compelled them to do whatever it took to get their friend to Jesus because they believed Jesus could do something for him. Their faith that drew Jesus' attention to the mess, it caused them to go to great lengths to be creative and risky. Their faith is what gave them the hope that Jesus could actually do something. And on the flip side of that, It was a scribe's lack of faith that blinded them to the reality of God standing in front of them and caused them to complain about something happening in a way that they didn't think should be done. They were complaining about Jesus forgiving the man's sins, an action they believed he had no power or authority to do anything about. And Jesus confronts them and names their misguidedness What is easier, to tell someone they are forgiven or to heal a paralyzed body? Well, you all tell me what would be easier for you. It's human nature for us to want to complain and to throw a fit when messes that we didn't cause interrupt our lives. This is not my mess. Why do I have to deal with this? And Jesus models for us that faith in Christ and Christ's work in our world should compel us to take the mess to Christ, fully believing that Christ can do something about it. And without faith, we are blinded from being able to see outside of our limited scope of control what we think is right and reasonable and possible in order to trust in the limitless power of God. Faith is what helps us to deal with interruptions. Faith, particularly the faith that the book, faith that the book of Hebrews defines as the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. That helps us to confront and gives us eyes for how to deal with the messy interruptions in our lives. Faith helps us to trust that God can and will do something about the situations in our lives, even the messy ones that have been thrust upon us. Faith is what redirects our attention to what is truly necessary and within our ability to do something about. Faith is having hope that no matter how much of a mess our lives may look like from time to time, that God is actively working to clean things up in ways we can and cannot see. And yes, we oftentimes find ourselves dealing with messes to clean up for that we didn't make, but our faith shows us who to take those messes to. Who to take those messes to for help in knowing how to deal with them. It's our faith that makes us do faithful things in the midst of messy interruptions. Now, I'm not saying that when something or someone disrupts our lives, we aren't allowed to feel bad or angry or sad. We are allowed to be disappointed when things mess up our plans and disrupt our lives, but we can't let our negative feelings and disappointments become barriers to our faith or acting in faithful ways. Jesus models for us at the beginning of his ministry, because remember, this is at the beginning at Mark. This is early on in Jesus' ministry that he already is dealing with these really messy interruptions, but it is not the only time that he's going to stare down and look at messy situations. And we've already looked at a couple of those scriptures. We're going to keep looking at some of these interruptions of Jesus, but nothing. Nothing tops 
the messy interruption that humanity as a whole has caused in this world through our sinful actions and just a sinful inaction. A big, messy interruption that Jesus directly confronts on the cross even when he could have pretended it wasn't there. A big mess that Jesus didn't make, but he cleaned up anyways in his death and resurrection, making way, a way for us to know healing and wholeness and salvation through faith. Christ never let the mess distract him from his mission. And we cannot let messy interruptions distract us from seeking Christ, following Christ, and being faithful even in the midst of a mess. And faith. Faith, my friends, this is a gift. It's a gift that God offers to each and every one of us. For those who have none, or if it's shaky at best. Christ comes and gives us the hope that will not disappoint, even when all else falls apart. For those of us who have some measure of faith, Christ gives us more to help us in the moments where we stumble and question, where we believe but need help with those moments of unbelief. But faith is a gift, a gift that gives forgiveness and healing and wholeness and direction. Life is full of messy interruptions we didn't make and we don't want to deal with, but Christ receives us in all of those messes, and he does something with them. And so by faith, we continue to come to Christ with our mess, and we ask Christ to do something with us. And our faith tells us that God will walk alongside of us, helping us to stand up and walk when those messy interruptions come our way. And that Christ has the power and the authority to receive us and bring us healing and wholeness, both now and forevermore. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, let us pray. Dear Lord, we do admit that there are so many messy interruptions that we face, and we don't like them, and, and we don't. Because sometimes it just feels like for those of us who are tired and feel overworked and stressed, that it's just one more thing to deal with. But Lord, you show us that it's okay to name them. We have to name them. And that our faith will give us a way in which we can bring to you that which gets in our way and makes a mess of our lives. So by faith, we come to you and we say, Lord, this is a mess. My life is a mess. I'm a mess. This world feels like a mess but I trust that you are working for the good of those who love you and are called according to your purpose. And so in this space, it is well. It is well with my soul, and I will trust in you. Amen.